Welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, mysticism, esoteric Christianity, esoteric philosophy, theology, whatever else we feel like talking about. This is an entry in our bonus series, The Black Iron Prison, where we talk to geniuses, creators, um, thinkers, philosophers, artists, uh, where Gnostic themes seem to be both popping up in their, in their work and in their perspectives. So uh, today, really big show. Really big show, folks. We have uh, Hunter Hunt Hendricks, uh, the uh, genius behind the band uh, Liturgy, as well as a number of other musical projects, as well as a philosopher and theologian. I just try to say, combine the words philosopher and theologian. But anyways, Hunter, hello. Thank you for joining us. Theosopher? <laughs> yes, theosopher, exactly. Um, before we actually get to have a bit of a dive into Hunter's work and philosophies and insights and revelations, uh, we have to descend a little bit from these heights because I have to very quickly plug our pay our uh, our financials because we're brought to uh, you by viewers and listeners like you. You can do one-time donations at paypal.com slash Gnostic. And you can also sign up for our Patreon, patreon.com slash Gnostic, where you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. If you sign up for the Patreon, you get early access to all the shows a week or two early. And we'll try to think of more things to give you, but you help to keep the show alive. And uh, we love you and we need you. And if you can't give us money, just share the show or tell people about it. Take this episode and email it to somebody that you love because they're going to love it. Okay, uh, time to ascend. Uh, Hunter, the the ancient Gnostics, they were heavily associated with creation myths. So that, that particularly um, grabbed my attention when Origin of the Alimonies came out. Uh, why did you choose a creation myth for the plot of this opera? And why are creation myths important? Like, like, who cares? Like, we got here, we're here, so what does it matter how and why we got here? Um, well, I mean, don't you think man is, like, an intrinsically metaphysical being? It, like, I think that the, the question of the origin of all things comes naturally to any child, you know? And then, like, uh, I think you stop asking about it and stop kind of um seeking when you're like shamed out of it you know mm -hmm. um, and then and that and that's what ideology is so it's so, so it's like a matter of freedom it's like like it's intrinsically tied to freedom i would say that like once once you're not asking the origin of the question like you've, ex you've unconsciously accepted uh like someone giving giving that answer to you um, and so, and, and that like limits your field of possibility. So like the more, I guess there, there's like, there's like creating an origin myth and like, the, there's like the myth itself, which like should have you know, some kind of positive content, but there's also just like the practice of uh, questioning and speculating. Uh, and those are like not the same thing, but kind of two, two things that I both think are rad. Yeah. I, I completely agree. And uh, it's almost like, you know, when Christ says, uh, you, you must be like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. That makes you think of, that's all kids do, right? It's why, 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 how, why, how, why, 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 why am I here? It's, they're, 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 they're shockingly existential little children. Uh, and you're right. I, I think I think that curiosity, that specific curiosity, that philosophical curiosity is sort of beat out of us by society. And when you say, Constructing an origin myth, interrogating an origin myth, creating an origin myth is a strike back against dominant ideology. I, I think that's exactly what the ancient Gnostics were doing as well. Uh, so, um, oh, I forgot something, which is uh, talking about music is a little bit of, like dancing about painting. So <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know Hunter's work, I would uh, heartily encourage you to, to pause this show uh, definitely come back to it. Pause this show. Go to her YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Hunter Hunt Hendricks, and listen to Origin of the Alimonies. And then come back here, hit play again, because uh, one, you'll have your mind blown if you already don't know the album. And then two, uh, you'll be able to engage just on that that deeper level with, with some of these uh, questions and comments. So next question. There's, there's a theory that opera began as a 
It's an alchemical performance that combined all the arts, so music, theater, dance, visual art, and it was a way to engage the soul and lead to transformation, maybe even enlightenment. Why was an opera the best way to communicate what you wanted to say in Origin of the Alimonies? Um, yeah. I mean, this is something that's, that's not a lot about. These, I mean, these two questions are, are kind of connected, you know, um, but in my view or whatever I have, um, the, the question of the origin of all things can't be answered discursively. Um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that kind of question. So like, um, there's no, I don't, like, I don't think a scientific formula, like, I don't think mathematical physics will solve the problem. I don't think that like conceptual elaboration will solve the question either. Uh, because it, you know, it, it question, you know, it includes the question of like the origin of, of science and, and philosophy for one. Um, but for, one could argue, or at least like speculate, that the question could be answered by um, an experience, or or like or like a kind of synthesis of like all modes of experience or something. So like, like it's like. Uh, the answer is apprehended as a kind of like epiphany that maybe um, like in the music in combination with uh, drama and images and so forth would uh, just, it would just like be like a lightning flash or something and you would like merge with the origin of all things. Because also the origin is not necessarily like a past event it's because it's an eternal origin. So it's also just like above, you know, so like, um, so, yeah, that's, I guess that's my answer, or part of it, I know we can talk about it some more, but. Yeah, exactly. Well, we actually had a, uh, a Muslim scholar and theologian on, we, and we, we talked briefly about something that is experiential and hard to put into words, which is this idea that the creation is always happening, like from the divine outflow, and, and it is eternal, and it's outside of time, and trying to understand that creation is always happening, that this outflow is always flowing from the divine, is, is something that we find in a lot of the mystical traditions, and when you talk to mystics, <laughs> um, they've had experiences of this, but it's very hard to put into to words, mm -hmm. but, but I think to try to put it into words, you know, talking about, you know, th this is one of the, the, the connections and one of the insights and one of the experiences that perhaps people can have through through a work like yours. Um, what are some of your influences on, on your theology and your philosophy? Oh, and sorry, Hunter, I keep, sorry to interrupt before I, before you even got a chance to talk, I keep saying Gnostic and Gnosticism and putting you into the Gnostic box, right, which I know is not necessarily a, a, uh, uh, a title or a term that that a lot of people love. I, I can at least say that there's Gnostic themes there. So I don't mean to put you into into a box that you may not belong in. So I'll just I, I'll just say that up top. So that said, what are your origins? I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah we, I mean, we can talk about Gnosticism. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, Gnosticism certainly is, you know, I mean, among my influences from like the Western esotericism, Gnosticism is probably like the smallest as far as I know. I mean, like the thing with esoteric traditions is like it's also like, like what do you even mean we're talking about gnosticism like there's there, there there's as many kinds of gnosticism as there are gnostic but that's that's kind of an overstatement but like that's among, pretty, that's but correct. There, there's been so much influence between kabbalah and hermeticism and gnosticism and christianity um just you know and, and vedanta you know in, in the 20th century like uh in, in terms of the kind of you know, when people started doing syncretic uh, you know, global, global theosophic esotericism or whatever. Um, so, I mean, again, I mean, that's, I'm certainly interested in, um, I mean, Kabbalah especially, but my original influences philosophically were um, from continental philosophy. Mm. Like, I originally got into you know, like, like in high school, like Nietzsche and Marx, and then uh, discovered Deleuze from there. And I've always been very interested in like, uh, you know, s like syntheses between like Marxist political economy and uh, like, you know, psycho psychoanalytic approaches and like, like theories of libidinal economy and like 
it, it, that makes a lot of sense to be doing when you're in philosophy and to make music too, because so much of that philosophy is about the role of affect. And um, and I was yeah I've been I've been like I'm I'm a Christian you know so so I as like an original philosopher my task has in a way always been to kind of figure out how to synthesize that that regime of thinking which is always about the atheist you know with, with what felt to me like just a personal experience of Christ that like uh, was getting left out and. So anyway, Christianity is a big influence. Like, uh, it's specifically, I mean, I really like, I kind of more recently gotten into like Death of God theology. I don't know these people, like, like Altizer, like Neville, um, like, like, like Christian theologians who are influenced by Blake and Nietzsche. And you know, like kind of uh, take seriously the idea that that like Blake and Nietzsche were prophets in their own way, that they were kind of continuing Christianity, you know, beyond the church in a kind of a new form from the um, I, I, I kind of believe that that's what I believe, you know? And so, uh, and that, I like some Islamic theology. I, I, I was studying Mullah Sadra for a while. And his, his eschatology, I think, is very beautiful, very powerful. Um, yeah, he built on and on and because like, I love, I have a lot, I'm interested in a lot of stuff, but like, and, and, and of course, I mean, as far as this, the opera goes, uh, Richard Wagner uh, was an influence in terms of this, this vision of Kassam Kinsberg. And, and Blake, I think, has a similar vision of total art. So, so these, these kind of total art visions from the 1700s and 1800s. Um, as as well as the kind of like fine art corollary to that in Fluxus, uh, like I really like, you know, shamanic occult, um, like institutional critique Fluxus artists. Type, you know, so it's just Joseph Boyce is kind of like my favorite artist, like uh, James E. Byers. Or, uh, so, yeah, I kind of just had passions. In, anyway, okay, go ahead, respond. Yeah. Okay. Oh no no no! I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, no, I, I was just going to say that that is, I, I think, in some ways, the the religious, the creative, and and the the gnostic um, urge, right, is is to combine these different influences in a way that makes sense, right? Gnosticism always being syncretic, cultism always being syncretic, the great philosophers always being syncretic, right? Now, sort of, I, I would say it's kind of a problem that we have now in the modern age where we have so much access to information, different traditions, we have access to everything with the computers that enslave us that are in our pockets, that it's very easy to make a synthesis but what you and other people of your rank do is make a synthesis that that makes sense, right? You're identifying what what fits together, in my view, uh, seeing where uh, the, where the uh, the round uh, pegs are that go into into the round holes, uh, and uh, creating a a, a a cohesive whole, right? <laughs> so uh, the uh, in in that Hegelian way. <laughs> I mean, speaking of Hegel, I mean, I think there's a strong case to be made that a lot of the you know, secular thinkers from Romanticism and on are reiterating Gnostic themes in their work in a subterranean way. You know, I mean, isn't, I mean Hegel is a Gnostic. Yeah. Kind of thing. He's more Gnostic than he is a Christian. He, he's an avowed Christian. I sort of wish he was more of a Christian. I think. Z, Zizek is a better Christian than Hegel, I think. Yeah, well, Zizek's uh, line is he's a better Christian than anybody. So, <laughs> um, which I was kind of. Sort of yeah. Precisely, and then I, I'm not sure how the, if I'm saying his name right, but uh, Thomas Alitzer, uh, Alitzer, the the uh, the Death of God theologians. I also see a lot of resonance with, um, and Gnosticism can often be backwards looking uh, to both the. The, the 19th century, right, with uh, with the, the sort of return of Gnosticism, with as you said the Romantics, and then looking back to to the second century, where sometimes we we stop um, uh, for people who who call themselves Gnostics, modern Gnostics are involved in modern Gnostic movements, and for some reason, okay, we're just going to jump over the 20th and early 21st century and not look at all these theologians that would have uh, resonance with uh, with what we believe and what we're trying to do. So. Um, 
Uh, so you mentioned Blake. Uh, I did see a wag on Twitter uh, call your music. I, I believe you, you prefer to say transcendental metal, which I would agree with, but uh, Blake metal. Um, Blake famously created his own Gnostic mythos. And there's an old story that, that each of the ancient Gnostics, this story isn't probably true, but uh, it was found in Heresiologists. They were actually required to write their own gospel, every single, each one of them. Um, should we all strive to do the same, to do what Blake did, or is it best to just go over received tradition? It seems like a lot less work. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think that's, I mean, I think the short answer to that question would maybe just be to like repeat it back to you or something, because I, I don't, um, I find that to be a perplexing question. In, in different phases in life, I've kind of decided, uh, I've come down on one or the other side, and, and I think that nobody has a really good answer to that question right now, because like, um, this is the thing is that I think so many people who are interested in religion in the past couple of years, like are kind of throwing at the baby with the bathwater in my view, because of, there's this like surge of like traditionalism that is like, that goes along with the kind of critique of like, you know, modern individualism or like identity politics or like basically like, like social justice, you know, like like it's a, just like denigration of the individual and of like, like the civil rights movement and feminism and, um, and like just even like, you know, like, like the right to be an autonomous creative individual and like, like the technological sophistication in society to like do that. And like, uh, you know that that's not what I like about religion. It's kind of the opposite. Like like that like that's like conservative. Like that's like bigotry. You know, like so. I think that creating a system of meaning in the way that uh, Blake endorses, and in the way that Nietzsche endorses, also. I mean, I guess maybe we're getting a little bit. I'm assuming a lot of like whatever. I mean, so like Blake and Nietzsche have essentially the same project. I would say you know, except that they articulate it in very different ways. Like Nietzsche's kind of revamp of like Zoroastrianism is kind of similar to like what they're both doing is kind of creating these religions of the individual. Yes. Um, th th that include, you know, like compassion, but it's like, you know, I must build a system of these to another man's. I think that's essentially true. And I think that any like active ongoing critique of ideology from a Marxist perspective kind of has to have that, you know, be because like that's the way to be non-ideological. Maybe, you know, is to kind of be thinking everything from the ground up, even though maybe it's kind of communistic or whatever. But um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, uh, but, but, but that can, I mean, obviously that can get kind of solipsistic and like, and like fluffy. And so there's, there's something in, in my experience when I flip flop between being more of a Nietzschean and more just like a, just a hardcore Christian. Like in the hardcore Christian phases, I'm just like, wow, like, you know, I, I needed during that time to like submit to authority, you know, and like do like, like perform aesthetic practices that I don't understand in order to sort of like, um, you know, get, get gains in my like, mental health or my, you know, and like, and, it, and it's hard to sort of, um, you know, it's hard to be an individual and to also be an ascetic in that way at the same time. And so I don't like, and I think about this a lot. So, so, so it's, it's, I don't know the answer to the question, but I think that, I just think it's important to not come down on one side or the other, I guess, is what I would say. You know, like, so, so many people just want to like, this is also a question of like appreciating history. You know, so many people want to like jettison the past and just like, um, uh you know see, like get rid of it you know, people want to just be trad and i just don't i think there's an important in between yeah uh, i completely agree with you and, and, and when you don't have um uh solid logical answers for some of these questions you know i am asking you about the uh the mysteries of the entire universe <laughs> so <laughs> like 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 what you just said this is actually a question i get asked a lot when i 
the, the when I the, the, in, in my parish in Montreal. So you know, I, I do I do uh, have a, a relatively small parish, and uh, a lot of people who come, you know, once or twice, they dig it, and perhaps they mean to come back, but I, I never see them again. But a lot of them ask, you know, why? Uh, because uh, my particular community has a, sort of a, a combination of of Gnosticism and high church traditions. So they will be like, well, why? You know, I'm really interested in Gnosticism, but you know, why are we doing this high church stuff, or why are we doing this this style of meditation instead of making up your own, or why why do why celebrate the mass and did not do something from the ground up? And and it is that push and pull because you know we do live in a different time from the past. Uh, we we have to speak to the needs of the present, uh, um, but at the same time there there are there are values in uh, and use of uh, these many ancient traditions, practices, thoughts. So so it's it's push and pull, and I haven't I haven't figured it out either. And I often sort of land in the middle when when someone. Uh, to be honest, demands an answer of me, right? Uh, and then that's probably all, as far as I can tell, always going to be my my answer. Um, uh, well, though, if, if I figure it out for sure, I'll let you know. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, can you post it? I mean, I mean also even more than that, like I feel like arguably they're not just useful, but like the, like the positive content is yeah. perhaps literally true in some ways. You know, like I you know, I kind of think that like Jesus is real, you know, um, and like I think the chakras are real. You know, and like, like it's not. So it's not all just like an artwork. It's not just like a useful artwork. You know, like I feel like, really, and and I don't. I guess I get different things from different religions. You know, like like I'm like to, to like I'm kind of more of a Christian in terms of my like practice and ethics, and more like I like a lot of like Sikh yoga practices or like Buddhist yoga practices. Like, like, so you can kind of also like construct your own religion from, I guess that's what you were just saying, actually. It's kind of mix, mi mi mixing and matching different beliefs and, and practices. But like it's, um, he's it's already said this too, that, that it's, not, it's not just a free for all, that, that there, there is some, I mean, that, 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 you know, that question can pre presupposes your epistemology and your transcendental metaphysics and stuff. But are, are, are there really higher worlds or not? You know, it's kind of, you know, Maybe someone like Hegel would say not. Maybe someone like Schelling would say there are, um, or, or or are the higher worlds just essentially cultural horizons? Um, you know, or or is it is it is is that question badly formed and in a, you know a, a, an approach of methodological pragmatism is better for whatever anyway? Yeah. No, that's. Uh, I I think. Um, Fans of the show, people who are who are used to me uh, rambling and ranting, uh, have picked up that I, that I often first go to the psychological and philosophical understanding of things, and I think it's because I have an unconscious need not to sound crazy in our secular society, right? So I'll often go for the Jungian interpretation or be like, you yeah. know, maybe there's not literally chakras or maybe literally bodily energy, man, but it's like, it's, it's a way to understand, you know, the connections between the body and the divine. and. There is also value of just saying you know, these things are real. I've experienced them. I've talked to other people who've experienced them, and we have records of thousands of years of human beings talking about them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so that reminds me. Uh, uh, sorry, a, a question I didn't send to you before, but uh, you know, just talking about your identity as a Christian and sort of moving within creative circles, moving within metal circles, moving within philosophical uh, circles. Uh, it, it is, you know, we live in the West. We live in. I'm in Canada, but I've uh, also lived in New York. Um, most of these circles in particular are are either uh, agnostic, atheist, or nowadays, within the last decade, uh, you know, the witches or occultists. Did, did people ever have a, a weird reaction uh, to you being Christian and talking about these ideas on your YouTube channel and then through your uh, artistic mediums? Yeah, it's been a little uncomfortable. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that in in the past maybe three or four years, it's, it's less uncomfortable. I think that there's, there's, it feels like there was kind of some cultural phase shift where like it didn't seem quite so nutty, uh, or like, yeah, be, be like an out Christian. Well, it, it, even as like a music person at all, almost, but also especially as an out Christian, like black, yeah. metal, black metal musician. Um, and I mean, of course, like my Christianity is not, you know, it's not like evangelical, like it's not standard Christianity. So I think it, it takes the edge off a little bit that I'm, you know, an Anishian and an occultist also. Um, 
But um, no, uh, I feel like there's more to say in answer to this question, but I can't quite say. Like, I, like I'm, I'm so familiar with talking about how like, controversial uh, like liturgy has been in the past. Yeah. Like, I love it. Just like, yeah, it's like, <laughs> 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 um, just before, uh, not not directly connected to, to what you're talking about, but picking up on, a, on an earlier thread before I forget with my garbage brain. But with you mentioning trad, I find it so funny, uh, like the trad calf uh, phenomenon. Like people who don't get it, who would never understand why young, you know, hipsters are, are suddenly devout Catholics. And I just look around and like to see this world where where people don't have community, where we don't have rituals that mark. Uh, um, rites of passages where we don't have larger narratives uh, like the God narrative, and be mm -hmm. like, you you don't see why why <laughs> why trad is growing? Like it's really, people are really you know hurting, and people are really looking for something. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. But then, like, I feel like when I when I started meeting more trad people, like on Twitter and stuff, like I ended up being kind of disappointed because so many of them are so neat. You know, like there's. Like it's, like it's like oh oh and you're a fascist too huh you know like <laughs> or like there's this um there's not there's not a lot of love in the version of christianity that comes from like people who maybe started out in the secular world and are like turning crap like it's it's there's there's this kind of like bitterness in a lot of it that like i don't really buy with um, i mean obviously i'm not can't make a totalizing statement about it. That's not entirely true. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's certainly, it certainly is understandable that that, especially, I mean, reality has just been fracturing so much in the past six or seven years, you know, like we're, we're accustomed to it now, you know, we're all kind of, we all kind of have these like sci-fi expectations of, of the future, you know, or like, and, and like we used to not, you know, or like, like, like it didn't, there's been this demonstration in the past like decade of just, like just how much technology can change things, and so it's like it's very the, the I think the secular horizon of meaning just, just cracked open, you know. So so it's like yeah, okay, we need to like um, we need yeah, we need a meaning system. We need we need we need to find something that's a little a little more a little more thorough, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I think you're correct, and it, it is, you know, the, partly a reaction to to hyper normalization in this crazy world we we live in. Uh, but I have noticed sort of a similar shift in, in the last decade or so, which which it also in, in many ways has has been positive because, uh, as you pointed out, um, perhaps it's a little bit uh, easier to talk about being a Christian now because there is this, this sort of search for meaning shift, and also you know, the witches and uh, Wiccans and occultists. Um, uh, who are very public about it, who are young, who are sort of in white collar environments, uh, they're really doing us a lot of service because if you're talking about literally casting magic spells, right, as your religious path, I find it's a little bit easier to talk about theology. <laughs> people's, people's horizons have already been broadened at least a little bit, uh, perhaps by their coworkers or, or by being sensitive to, to others' uh, searches. So, um, you mentioned Kabbalah being an influence, and, and I did I, I do see a lot of uh, Lurianic Kabbalah uh, in your work, and and also in esoteric Christianity. Th there's this idea that creation it's it's unfinished and it's broken, and one of the reasons, or the main reason, or the reason humans were created was to be as fellow creators to to finish the universe to other to finish creation. Uh, what's your view on this idea, and and do you think this idea relates to the artistic process at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, you know, so many, it, all my favorite thinkers, whether they're um, Kabbalists or not, I think always kind of arrive at this idea of the primordial wound, or like, 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 like the Felix Culpa or something. But, I mean, it's kind of a, it's a question of theodicy, you know, because it's kind of the same as the problem of evil, you know, why, uh, why is there evil in the world? The the answer it's a, this is kind of similar to an earlier question, but like the you know a, a theodicy isn't isn't about the content of the theodicy. It's a, it's about the, the, that wound is what makes you ask the question of the wound, and then you can sort of engage in an ongoing art practice to try to answer the question. So like the the the, the answer to the question of the primordial wound is the attempt to answer it. Um, 
arguably. Um, but yeah, I mean, and, and that's and that's what's. I mean, there's the 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 plot of my opera is essentially a rendering of the of the Kabbalistic concept of, of the shivirat, the, the the primordial shattering um, of, of God within God, and kind of the the, like the setting up of the kind of dynamics that uh, you know ultimately will arrive at the Shekinah. You know, death, but whatever, uh, and uh, but but it's not just yeah. Again, I mean, like, because you find that in Hegel, I, I think that I kind of I like the I like the mythological form of it, but like it can also be presented in abstract form. I think that in Hegel, like you know, the Hegel sees history as the primordial subject and predicate, and, the, and the, there's a cosmic imbalance because of like. Like the mark of like a primordial word, and that's why the transcendental horizons of history cascade so that like ultimately subject and substance can be united, and that's this like you know theogonical, anthropogonical kind of process where those two things are happening at the same time. Um, or, or in Blake with like you know probably on looking up, um, like there, there are materialist versions of it, you know, in like in Schelling and Nietzsche and, and Deleuze, where it's like a, it's like a, 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 a material excess you know, that, that God is like, God is too much for God to handle, or like the difference between God and nature produces this like fold within God of reflection or Christ or like Sophia or whatever, and like that. Um, here's for a second but like uh yes the the the, the primordial wound thing is great <laughs> and i think that, that, that it's true <laughs> <laughs> yeah um are the concepts about the divine in your music and and on your youtube channel which which by the way well i'll mention this again at the end but please go to hunter's youtube channel to also watch her talk about these ideas uh she has a number of homilies on there where she's discussing and going deeper than some of the ideas that, that we're talking about today but these concepts uh, about the divine in your music and youtube channel uh and i guess this kind of relates to my earlier question as well but are they meant to be your expression of your understandings about god or do you think that they're ideas that others should really adapt and, and explore you mean like so? Are, are they just mine, and no one should take them seriously, or are they the other? The, the other should do them too. I, I guess I'm asking in, in a nice way. Do you want to start a cult, Hunter? <laughs> are you? No, that's I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. But is yeah. it? Is, do you see when, when you're talking in, in some of the synthesis of of the philo of, uh, philosophy that you're doing? Are, are you sharing something that is meaningful for you and uh, people can reflect upon in more of an artistic way to be like, you know, that's neat. I, I can, but I can leave it or take it. Or are you really sharing to to say? Um, or putting across these ideas to be like, you know, this this is how I, I think the universe works. That you may want to seriously consider this and integrating it into your, your own understanding of the universe. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they are meant to be seriously considered. Like, I, like I am doing the best I can, you know. And like, I think that, uh, you know, I would argue it depends on your approach, but I would argue that you're not you're not really doing philosophy unless you're making an honest attempt to arrive at a truth that is objective in some sense. Um, but I mean, I mean, that said, like, uh, I, like, I don't feel able to escape the contemporary image of thought uh, uh, where like, you know, we all know that any regime of thinking is apparently a temporary horizon, you know? And so like, like I, you know, that, like in the way that like Nietzsche thought of it, or, uh, you know, you know, Deleuze has a great chapter about this in *Difference and Repetition*. The, 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 the image of thought as instead of like instead of thinking that sort of um, arra arranges the world in the most correct and rational way, where truth is opposed to, to falsehood, uh, thinking is a kind of I guess artistic creation. I mean, obviously, it's art, but like a, a kind of a kind of existential creation that emerges not out of falsehood, but from from madness or from pain. So it actually goes back to the primordial wound question, you know, like that that it's the it's it's the because there's you know, 
it, it depends how Ptolemaic you want to be metaphysically, whether there is whether God actually has his own primordial wound and I have a primordial wound. But like, uh, I, I kind of think there are both actually. Uh, but like, in, in any case, one every, every human has an existential wound, you know, and uh, and I I mostly expect my uh, various works and their kind of integrated uh, crystallization to be appreciated as something that should be inspiring. I guess maybe to not to not so much get people to like think what I think exactly, but to uh, to like uh, yeah to 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 be more likely to try to do the same thing themselves than they would otherwise. But so, but so that is kind of me thinking that I'm right and they should at least do that. Yeah. yeah. Um, another softball question. Hunter, is there a true <laughs> self, an authentic self? Um, I, mean, I feel like that's almost a softball question because it's like, it's not, I, know. I, I, I mean, by the way, this is like the only type of conversation I really enjoy having. Like, like I, I, yeah, I only have a few close friends, and like this is pretty much all I talk about with them. I, I know it kind of, um, and I've always just kind of been that way. I don't, I don't know what. what uh, I guess that's weird, but apparently you're like that too. Yes, <laughs> this, is, this is all. This is all I want to talk about, and uh, the, and I'm glad that that I have this uh, this this show to do it with. So it's uh, it's it's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, <laughs> to be able to. Start podcast, yeah. yeah it's like when yeah when it's like when the record button is playing it makes more sense to talk about these things almost to people you know yeah. like it's like yeah, anyway um uh to yourself so yeah i mean again there's lots of angles that i like but i i would say like my so i I cover this topic in the field of like axiology in my system, which is um, that that term does not usually really apply to this question. But like, like axiology is like theory of value. You know, what, what what are what are what is value? What are values? What are the different kinds of values? How are they? Um, like truth, goodness, beauty, that kind of thing. Um, I would say that. The soul has like three aspects. Well, there's there's kind of like, well, okay, there's like there's like the psychodynamic version of this, and maybe the more like scientific psychology version of this. You can think of it as like will, intellect, and imagination, which is more of like a, like a static thing, or the uh, you know the id id and super ego slash I think usually more in the Kantian in terms of Freudian, so the like real imaginary and symbolic yeah. um so i think so the authentic so i think what people tend to think of as the authentic self which is like you know your true vision or something i i, I think that that is just one part of the authentic self and that there are three parts so like you have your you have you have the real i, I call it uh, the genesis call right which is just kind of like essentially it's the it's the primordial wound that we've been discussing and then in the early years of life, I think before you really learn um, language and your communication is primarily emotional and effective, that's where like a part of your soul forms, where your your style of like intimate relating um, takes shape, uh, like with like you know, your like the love between you and your mother or whoever, as well as your like your your unique your unique drive. Um, and those things happen contingently. Uh, you know, it's like just you get kind of attached to something because of some experience you had, and that kind of like maybe also because of what kind of talent you have or something, and that kind of sets the destiny of like what your dream is, like what what, what would really satisfy you. To do. And then when you gain language, uh, that's that's when your social being emerges. I think it like eight to ten or, you know, from beyond and then you kind of you've taken on a social role and you have to think about you know fitting in and kind of just you know, power and the, the recognition and just like practical stuff you know 
And so I think that, and, 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 and that's the, the symbolic that, that you sort of, uh, um, that you, you know, everyone has to submit to the symbolic. And so it's, it's not like the, so to get in contact with your authentic self would be to like manage those three dimensions in, uh, in a self-aware way. You know, it, it's not that like, you have a false self, I think, if the symbolic has like totally crushed the inaccurate, right? And then like you're, you're, you're living as your persona and like your true desires and feelings are like um, mysterious to you. And so they, because they're repressed. And so you, you know, they, they, they come out in like messed up ways that are self-destructive um, and so forth. So, so, so in a way the imaginary is at yourself, but like, but, but that's only if you're neurotic. So if you're, if you're like more psychotic or perverse or like more of like a, a cluster A personality disorder type or whatever, then like you're probably, you, you don't have enough of the symbolic in you. And like, and like you, and I'm a little closer to this kind of person where, where like, where like um, creating authentically, is just like totally natural to you and you're, and you're very kind of, um, uh, you're, you're able to just, you, you know that you think what you think and that you're really doing what you feel like and you're not like living in someone else's dream, but it's kind of hard to relate to the world. And um, so, so, so the, the authentic self, I think, is, in, involves, yeah, involves conscious awareness of like one's own inner map in those three areas and then like hmm. finding a way to put them in, in positive feedback in a kind of flourishing way that like allows you to kind of create and share and grow and have compassion and, and this kind of thing. So it's like, a, so, so yes and no, I guess. Yeah, no, fascinating. And, and I actually need to do just a whole show on the tripartite self because it's, it's an idea that you find throughout oh, cool. many different cultures and millennium. And, and as you said, right into the modern day and quote unquote scientific ways. <laughs> so, um, but but I, I think you're spot on and, and I think it's a very interesting and useful model because I think the model that a lot of uh, modern esotericists of all sorts of different backgrounds and traditions, including esoteric Christians, the, the model is is a false self with a, with a real self, the soul, if you like, or spirit below it, right? But um, this, this tripartite, um, the vision of the self, I think, makes a lot of sense to people. Like it, intuitively, once you explain it, if they kind of think about some of their perhaps bodily urges when they think about some of the the stuff that seems to arise uh, from the unconscious, from some of the stuff that seems to arise from the conscious. And there also does seem to be a history of of other thinkers saying that that putting these three selves into alignment it could even construct or create the true self. Uh, you know that that's Gurdjieff, or um, I think even some. Some readings, uh, some strains of modernism, and I would say even some strains, uh, some readings of Plato. Uh, you know, he wouldn't say true self, but he has that tripartite construction, and it is the the unifying, the understanding, the coordinating, the having the free in the right place that that truly creates the self. So that's that's fascinating. I, I, I guess I guess another aspect of to it is the question of then what where does God's will fit in? You know, because like because I think. To, to be a, a good Christian, you would actually then want to sacrifice your true self, um, or you, you would want to submit to God's will, and that your, your true self is actually what God wants for you. And I do think there's something to that. Like, I like, I'm, like in some ways, I, uh, I mean, like my favorite esotericist was uh, Tom Berg, who wrote Meditations on the Tarot. I don't know that, but, but like, yep, you know, yeah. So, so he, he's a, a Christian. It's a Christian Hermetic Kabbalah, basically. Uh, and that's what he calls it, um, with a lot of influence from Bergson and uh, Jung also. But um, what was I about to say? Oh, God's will. Yeah, that, that like, like, like he he's a bit prissy as a Christian, you know. Where like, like he like he doesn't like magic, like he, like that, that's like about manifestation. He thinks that that properly sacred magic is only magic that makes contact with God's will and that allows a circuit to pass from God's love to the world and that and that all it's allowed to do is sort of um, uh, 
uh, break down their false consciousness, you know, and like, uh, like, like dissolve the meaning systems and the suspicion and, uh, you know, whatever, that their sinful natures and that like, um, So, but anyway, I mean, you, you can certainly find a way to get top of the authentic self to fit with. Oh yeah, and so and then in his ideal, you, that's where kind of prayer. That's that's where prayer comes in, I think. Really, like I think you can use psychoanalysis or like schizoanalysis or whatever to achieve a lot of what I'm talking about. But then, like, I, the, the reason what prayer does for me is it. Uh, like, like I do a lot of praying for God to, you know, allow me to forget about my will and serve His will. And I, and I think that there's this—I I don't know how widespread this scene, maybe you know, from other places. I think I think you know esotericism generally like a lot better than me. But like that, if you can turn your—if you have will, intellect, and imagination—that to be enlightened um, is which uh, which Tom Berg associates with the, the magician, the first major arcanum, is that you turn your will into an organ of perception. Uh, so instead of having a will, you perceive, you can detect God's will, and then you turn your intellect into imagination, which softens it, and you harden your imagination into something more like intellect, which causes it to like submit to the truth rather than um, come up with its own creations, kind of. Yeah. Um, and, and I kind of think that's really cool. Like, I, I think I think that the, in the in the kind of contemporary horizon of art, like the idea, and I, I try to do this. I, I try to only create what God is telling me to. Um, so, so like, if, if I have something that I want to do, I, I try to let God run things. Um, and so, so I think there is a way to be a kind of autonomous creator and still be Kind of a trad about like following God's will, but I think that it's it, it takes a lot of legwork to figure out how that's consistent. But I think it, I think it is possible. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, and no, you described the, the model quite well. Uh, the, the relation between will, God's will, imagination, I, and I, I think that really is what occultists uh, were and are getting to. But it, but it's funny because you really what you described that model would also be what a uh, Saint Ignatius of Loyola would say, right? This is this is what the Jesuits would teach you to do if you went and did spiritual training with the Jesuits. So it's just not related to to occultists. Uh, and I think it is, of course, a useful and practical. Uh, both for living our lives and living the lives that God wants us. But I, I think a lot of people out there uh, are immediately made the same connections that you did to actual creativity, right? And and creating. Um, so we, we did mention the false self, but there's a lot of discussion right now around false consciousness, about the simulacra, about the dream world, the cyberspace. You know, the Gnostics, of course, are big on, on the illusionary nature of the exterior world and, and how humans are really deceived by, by internal and external forces. So, so Hunter, are we in a dream world? What's keeping us there and how do we wake up? Yeah, so there's like the, uh, yeah, there's the like, um, you know, ancient version of this that's you know, confined in the Upanishads or whatever, and then there's the kind of, you know, critique of ideology from, say, Marxist perspective, or, uh, or, you know, Nietzsche's critique of the free world. Or, uh, I, I, I would say that, so, so again, so, I mean, <laughs> covering those bases because, as with, with everything, this is kind of my approach. I, mean, I, I think maybe you get or already know it, but like I try to look at everything in terms of I call it a ceaseless catharsis, fervor, and majesty, which is sort of like like um, like, like sacred thought, kind of more like scientific rationalist thought, more kind of like nihilistic libidinal thought, and then and then the synthesis of those as a work of art. That, 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 that's my approach to every topic that I try to philosophize about. So. Um, be, because they're all like, because they're all different, because they're, e each approach misses something, I think, generally. Um, so like, as far as the contemporary ideological situation, you know, yeah, I think, I think that it's, uh, you know, that capitalism plays a big role in it, you know, um, but that it's um, uh, something that is intrinsic to the human condition as well, you know, be, being a social being is to kind of be in 
be in a trance, a kind of collective lie, but that the, 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 what, the way that's intensified in the current time is that it's um, like the market kind of hijacks people's um, you know, habits and, and, and expectations and you know, desires on a much kind of, you know, and, and they're, they're like their sense of their true identity, even their sense of their creative selves. Like that's, that, that's I feel like a lot of like society of control critics like to sort of fo focus on, on, on this idea that like, you know, even, even your, your sense of your uniqueness that is supposedly outside of the, the conventional public space, like even that is ideological. Um, and even, and then uh, over, over generations, even like movements that are um, emancipatory or radical in some way, like, you know, maybe they'll create a pocket of freedom for a couple of years or a generation, but that then there's like a, there's just this kind of structure in place that will kind of, you know, eventually pin the butterfly to the page and turn it into something you know, oppressive, um, and and I mean, arguably, we're like in a, a in a historical period where that never even gets a chance to happen for a second. That, it, that everything is kind of like pre pre ideologized um, as it, as it appears um, in culture. So my so I don't I mean that that's a that's a pretty dark prognosis or dark uh, so word like con condemnation of the state of affairs. Um, I'm not, I can't think of the exact word I'm thinking of, but um, my like what? So my 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 practice of perichoresis is an attempt at like if if that's how ideology currently functions. Um, my practice of perichoresis, which is a an effort to um, you know do, do like what I'm doing with my opera and uh, and my my band and the philosophy system, which is to have a, an, an ongoing multimedia kind of creative practice where the, the different parts are um, integrated according to a structure that has, that there's a theory for, right? that, that, that they're, they're integrated in a, a rational way that, um, that, that, that has rules, that, that, that like that would be a way to sustain a, a space that is outside of the power structures in, in a more enduring way because it actually like um, draws energy from itself. So like, like to me, it's very, I don't think I'm saying this that well, but like it's very important for me to not be, you know, like, like I, I would never be able to be like just someone with a band, you know, and just be like, okay, so like, my wheelhouse is the music industry. You know, I want to get the best reviews I can, and go, you know, play the biggest shows I can, and all this sort of stuff. Like, I think that like if you care about freedom and like uh, you know creating heaven, creating a better world, like I think that that type of activity is ideological in advance. That that you're sort of you can't do that without just drinking the Kool Aid of um, whatever the kind of contemporary regime needs from you. And, and I don't think you can do it as a philosopher either. You know, I, I don't, like the Frankfurt School likes to imagine that like thought is inherently autonomous, that it's inherently kind of away from the world. Mm -hmm. And like, I think, I think, I think a lot of like modernist composers also felt that way, you know, it's like, oh, like, um, there's something about how difficult modernist music is, that it's, it's autonomous. It's, it, but, but I, don't, I don't think it's true. I, I don't think that high culture is, is, is autonomous any longer at least you know I, I think that um, that thought is ideological too and that fine art is ideological um, but that uh, if, if, if you restrict your practice to that domain but one could imagine synthesizing the domains and then being you know, so, so, so that then you are and, and the internet helps with this you know so, so that then you're, you're alien like, like my project is very alien in every world that it appears, you know, like yeah. the philosophy, obviously in music, if you know anything about liturgy, you know, it's, 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 it's a very alien project with a metal, but like as a philosopher too, like because I, I talk so much to like kind of contemporary atheist philosophers, 
like I, I kind of you know just like yeah like i'm not taking it's not that i'm not taking seriously exactly but like that, that like um it, it it seems it's not like on brand or something for contemporary philosophy to like talk about god it's i'm sure you're, you're well aware of it, man and, and, and so but then like having a certain rigor to a synthetic project that doesn't make sense from any one space. Um, and then like, like I don't know, I, I think it'd be cool for there's like people to do things like that um, in, in different ways, you know, not just in the way I do it, obviously. And like, for there to be a little kind of pockets of culture that are like that. I think there could be um, non-ideological spaces that could be enduring if they're sort of structured in that way. So that's all like a, a hyper speculative theory, um, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, extremely groovy and uh, uh, intriguing as well. And uh, I think definitely something to, to work towards. Um, it, it's no longer creators who have to, and I put have to into quotes, but it's true, who have to brand themselves. It seems that we, we all of us, right? Like not, not just musicians, but if we use the internet, uh, all of us have to do for, for our careers. And is, is there any way to avoid being a brand in this modern world? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's our question. I'm not sure what I think about this topic. Like, I mean, I don't think in a way you can, I mean, if you choose to, I mean, you know, it, like the word brand is kind of a slur, I guess, in a way. You know, once you say brand, I guess from a certain perspective, not everyone says that way, but like, it's like, okay, but if you have a brand, that means you're sort of um, betraying your authenticity or something, or, or like, a, and in, in, in some ways, I kind of like how it's kind of, I, I sort of like the practice of kind of having like a micro brand on social media. Uh, you know, like it's, it's, um, it's, it, it's great to kind of be able to, like I enjoy, you know, I'm like a creator kind of, you know, like, like I you know, mostly work through like Bandcamp and like, uh, you know, do, do a lot of you know, promotion for stuff just, just through, you know, like, like social media platforms that just have, um, you know, subscribers for a variety of reasons without going through a larger like, press machine or whatever. And like, I mean, it's great, you know, it's, it, it's, it's I, I, I enjoy doing it in a way, um, but it is, and nevertheless is kind of unfortunate that it has to be that way. Like, I mean, I've actually really, had that said, I've kind of really recoiled from it in the past couple of months. Um, I'm just like, man, like I've got to, got to get the hell off of Twitter um, not, not not just because of like having a brand exactly, but just because of the uh, the the emotive, you know, the, 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 the um, like like monitoring how things are going, and it's kind of like if you're doing it for a while, it kind of like gives you weird habits that are kind of like not helpful, I guess. I don't know. I, I, I flat out say Twitter gives you brain damage, but uh, I'm <laughs> I'm a, a, a daily user, uh, yeah. and uh, people who um, uh, I discovered your work a couple of years ago with um, with uh, do you prefer Hawk or or the acronym H H A A Q? But with, with that album, someone sent it to me and it was like um just uh you know you, you will really dig this and you'll take the philosophy behind it but uh people who who watch this particular mini series and talk noses will talk noses will, will probably notice that um a lot of the guests are are people i admire on twitter <laughs> so yeah. it, it does does serve its its uh purpose uh there are, there have been some some great things that have come out of it for my life but uh also i, I wouldn't mind having my right lobe uh no. back yeah no, I, mean, I mean i went through a long time doing liturgy without really having any community and I pretty much found all of it through Twitter in the past couple of years. You know, yeah. like, 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 like Twitter, Twitter's very special, or at least it was, it feels a little different now yeah. than, it, than it did in like say 2019 or something. Um, yeah. So, uh, but, yeah, but I, I never want to be like, anybody complains about Twitter on Twitter, even though it's like, oh, Twitter's so terrible. Um, I'm going to tweet that, you know, and like, uh, so I try not to be a Twitter hater, but, but I, I have like, I've tweeted like five times in the past three months when I used to tweet like ten times a day. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, staying on on um, 
community, when you perform, do you ever feel a connection that, that's sacred to your audience? And, and I mean sacred quite literally. Definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, my band is called Liturgy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, the, the concept behind it was always that, uh, so I mean, for those who don't know, a, a liturgy is a kind of a sacred sequence of events. Or whatever. Like there's, there's a Catholic liturgy. Um, it's not, but it's not just a Catholic thing. Like, uh, we, we perform certain actions uh, in, in a way that uh, kind of you know, su summons the divine, basically, and uh, um, brings people together in the divine. And, you know, it's a, not, it's a very old theme that music can be um, a vessel for that, or, may, or maybe that is the highest task for me. It's, it's, it's supposed to be it's the best thing for music to do. And so, um, yeah, I, uh, I, in live, I mean, live liturgy performances, I feel so abstract to imagine doing a live liturgy performance, but our shows are very, very, very intense. Um, and so it's, it's really no, um, like, I don't think anyone that goes to a liturgy show and doesn't feel like, at least the intention was to create the feeling of like heaven coming to earth or whatever. Um, or like to, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that experience of, of eternity. I like, I mean, a lot of, a lot of music that I like that is sacred typically does not um, harness like intensity and volume and kind of brutality in the way that I like to, you know, like, like a lot of sacred music is much more meditative. Um, so I, I think it can be, that, that, that's always a compositional concern of mine in a way is to like, and obviously a musical performance brings people together. I mean, that's the reason it does. But like you can have a rock show where like just people show up mad and then they just stay mad or something. Like there's, there's different kinds of vibes you can create. And so like to create a truly spiritual cathartic experience is maybe not the same as creating, you know, just a great third experience, which I mean, doing that is great too. I, I, I love like regular rock shows as well. But um, which is part of why I like to make the music both really kind of trippy and complex, and also really like jagged and uh, and stuff because I'm jagged and stuff. Um, to kind of yeah, har 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 harness different different modes of transcendent uh, performance at the same time something yeah. yeah and um sort of following up uh, on that and uh and a final question both uh, both inspired by a previous question by the closing track on origin of the alimonies what what is your understanding of quote unquote the church the ecclesia yeah I, well i definitely think of the church as being a um you know, something that doesn't have a name that needs to be constantly constructed and renewed. Um, it, in some sense, it is a community of people who see the world in a utopian way and are bound by, you know, bonds of love uh, and sincerity rather than by like social inscription and so forth. So like that, that, that could apply to various types of communities that don't see themselves as religious um, as well as to, I, I think that's what clearly the, the early Christian church was. Um, as far as like, I mean, that, that's kind of, that's what I think that's what, what Zizek's answer would be to that question. That, that, that's like Zizek being in church. But then yeah. like, that, that doesn't fully satisfy me. Um, since, since again, I'm a bit more of like a, a, a dogmatist with religion. You know, I kind of believe in it. So like, I like, like I like the church. Um, of course, there's not one church. But like, so as far as the question of like, what is the status of like, the Christian Church, um, yeah, my, my, I mean, I, I know that wasn't quite the question either, but like, I, I do, 
I do think that there is some, like, there ought to be at least some kind of like human proxy for spiritual authority on earth or something. Like, 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 like I like the idea of there being like a real like hierarchical church almost, um, I, I guess, but like I, I've never been, you know, it's it just, it, the church is just always so behind the times, you know, I mean like, 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 like churches, you know, I, I don't know, like, I mean, especially the Catholic Church, obviously, it, it tends to be more reactionary, and they, they try to catch up with, like, queer civil rights and feminism and so forth, but, like, they, you know, they, they don't really catch up. Um, but I don't, I don't think that the church is just, the, the problem with the Zijekian approach, or the Hegelian approach, which is kind of similar, is that, like, it's not just whatever is new, you know, it's not like, it's not, it's not like the church is just like the leading the leading edge of civilization on its path towards uh, you know ultimate fulfillment in like the next era for society because um, because that 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 ends up I think I, I think that it kind of reduces to some kind of like nihilistic you know uh, I think that that's because technology is such a big part of the thrust of, of contemporary society, uh, I'm not like anti-technology at all, but like I do think that the church has to have some kind of sense that it doesn't belong in the world, you know, that, that like that it's um, that it is standing against even what's most new and interesting in the in the ordinary world. Um, that that's like that that's like inherent to a church that, that it's sort of impossible to understand it from the practical perspective and um and, the, and that it should really be uh you know the house of god and uh and uh, uh for like god's spirit to really be present it's kind of a fractured answer so yeah no, it's amazing. And unfortunately, uh, we are, we are, I, I have to leave the aeonic time flow, <laughs> come back into the time of the Archons, because we're at almost uh, an hour mark. But uh, I, I'm sure we could literally go all night. And I know I could certainly go all night uh, listening to you. And I know our audience could as well, Hunter. But we should, uh, we should unfortunately wrap up. But that said, uh, once more, uh, everybody go to Hunter's YouTube. So youtube.com slash C slash Hunter Hunt Hendrix. Hunter, I, I, I told people to, to listen to your album. I, I, forgot, I forgot to really like, you know, dive into the mythology of the opera. If people want to, to, to know more about the mythology that you constructed for the opera, it, it would, would lectures on your YouTube channel be, the homilies on your YouTube channel be the best way to engage with that material or if you've written anything or anything that goes along with it? Um. Yeah, the lectures are good. I, I've written probably more. I, I have like a philosophy website uh, called uh, like arcwork.org, um, which has I think, more detail on it. Uh, and also, you can buy the album on Bandcamp. Uh, right. Please buy the album. <laughs> and, but um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, um, anyway, there's, there's info on YouTube. Amazing, amazing. And uh, quickly before we go, uh, I also have closing plugs, uh, but one is uh, uh, my church does a, a yearly combination of of a conference and a retreat that they call Conclave. It usually moves around from different communities year to year. Uh, this year, it's going to be online because of the crisis. It's going to be at the end of the May, uh, end of May. So everybody out there, uh, feel free, uh, joeandike.org slash Conclave. Uh, we'd love to see you there. And I do um, secular mindfulness-based meditation every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. online. Uh, I am going to start doing it in person when things open up, but it will always be online as well. We'll just set up a camera in the meditation studio. This is free. Um, it's top by and Gnostic, but it's not Gnostic uh, uh, or religious in nature. It does come out of the secular mindfulness uh, movement. But, uh, you know, if you're a spiritual practitioner, meditation is always good. It's great for beginners, as I said, but it's also great if you're experienced. It's a mix of quiet and it's a mix of guided. Feel free to check that out. One last plug, holygrail.substack.com. Uh, that's where I uh, have my uh, parish newsletter, which is just mostly listings of the online meetings that we do. Right now, it's usually in person in Montreal. It'll go back to just being 
being in person, but for the time being, it's online. Feel free to check that out, everybody out there. Uh, Hunter, uh, incredible thanks. Uh, we'll have to have you back again. It's, it's been so awesome. I know everybody out there is going to love this episode. And for those who didn't listen to uh, her whole body of work, go do that and buy the album, buy all the albums. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> Thanks.